Uh, hello, colleagues. Uh, my name is Maxim Lapshin, uh, owner of Flasonic, and uh, today I'm going to introduce our important and interesting guest, uh, Jean-Baptiste Kempf. Uh, he is the um, d d director of VLC, and we'll have a, a nice and interesting uh, presentation today from him about the motor, the the uh, the edge, uh, the cutting edge technologies in VLC, the decoding of uh, of highest resolution that which is uh, possible today, the 8K. And um, uh, so uh, our uh, pre presentation will st start soon in several minutes. And uh, please remember that you can ask questions during the during this presentation. You can use uh, chat on the website. You can use chat in Telegram. Leave uh, there your questions. And after the presentation, I will forward the, forward them to Jean Baptiste, and uh, he will answer. Uh, he will also answer uh, several of them. We'll have maybe one or two questions uh, during this uh, uh, broadcasting, and then we will move to the Zoom, to the discussion where you will have unlimited uh, amount of questions. Uh, where, so, uh, what, what, what time will, uh, uh, will uh, Jean-Baptiste will be able to spend for this uh, discussion? Um, also, please uh, leave your leave your. Uh, uh, rate rate this uh, uh, presentation in your player. It is very important. Uh, feedback is very important for for making a good presentation. So please, uh, if you like it or don't like it, always leave your feedback. It's very important to all of us. And uh, so, uh, uh, Jean Baptiste, uh, we are going to speak today about 8K. I remember I remember 10 years ago when we were just uh, discussing if the internet can uh, can can survive uh, HD video. And uh, we have moved for, for uh, right now we're moving to 4K, uh, and we're going next step. It's 8K. It's uh, is the is the internet uh, and uh, computers are re uh, re ready for this? So yes. Okay. So, so like 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 when we started, like it was HD and oh HD is useless. You can't see blah blah blah. Now even like the smallest phone has an HD screen, right? And then we say, well, 4K, no one see any difference. And then now most of the TVs sold around the world are are, are 4K, right? And it's just like and like even some phones have like resolution that are 4K. So mm -hmm. um, I think there is a need and there is a question about VR in AR where you're just looking at a small subset of the scene, right? So even if you just care about a small angle, uh, which is around maybe HD or 4K, then the whole video for the whole scene is around 8K and it makes sense. So I don't think there is any stopping in that. Um, and I think, yes, the internet can do it, right? Like we have fiber almost everywhere right now. Um, and we have new codecs, right? We have AV1, we have VVC, and they make basically the video twice or three times slower, uh, smaller for the same quality, right? So like, I think that like trying to say, well, it's useless is we've heard that all the time. It's like de facto it's going to happen. Um, but I agree that like once we got 8K uh, HDR playback, like the next steps is going to be like in a longer time, right? Because what we see is that the evolution was very, very quick because like moving from SD to HD was a true revolution. Moving from HD to 4K is it's cool, and 4K to SK is oh maybe it's useful for some use cases, right? So after that, like even for professional, it's going to take maybe like it's going to slow down in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, so uh, the last question here will be, uh, how do you think? Uh, so, uh, for some technologies, we can say that uh, there is a moment when, we, uh, when it is still too young, but then we can say that uh, after two years, it is, uh, it is already everywhere. Uh, so somewhere between, this, uh, between these two points in time, uh, the break, uh, the, uh, some, uh, some, something changes. So uh, how do you think, when, when 8K will, will become... Um, just think that is everywhere. So uh, I think that um, by the next Olympic Games, so 2024, okay. I think, 2024, 8K will be the broadcasting default. Okay. Right? Like everyone, everyone in the professional industry will shoot in 8K. Uh, many of them will do that and process in 8K. And of course, scale down to, to the end user. But a professional will be 8K. Um, 12 bit or 10 or 12 bit. Um, and those will be like, that's going to be the start. In the homes of people, I don't know, maybe 10 years. 
<laughs> okay. So we're speaking about a thing that will be uh, with, our, with, our, with us everywhere in next two years. So it is, very, uh, it is, it is a real cutting edge, uh, but it is not about something virtual. It, it is already going here. And so let's go to your presentation and let's, uh, let's listen for you. It's, it's important sure. and interesting. So good morning. Um, my name is Jean Baptiste. I'm the president of the Videolan nonprofit, and I've been working on VLC and FFmpeg and other open source projects for the for the last 15 years. And I'm going to talk about a bit about Videolan and a bit about a, an interesting experiment we did, which was um, 8K decoding in HDR, uh, which was done over 5G network live um, or for the Roland Garros uh, Tennis Open, so the French Open, uh, that was done in June uh, 2019, and how we had to modify VLC to be able to do that. So I'm 38 years old. I'm French. I'm a geek. Uh, I've been a programmer most of my life, and I'm, I'm keeping doing that. But I do a lot of other things around open source and multimedia, um, and trying to, to get the open source technologies to go further. Uh, whether it's on decoders and encoders or players and everything related to multimedia. Uh, I've been involved and I'm now the president of the Videolan nonprofit since uh, a long time. I joined the VLC project in 2005 and I created Videolan in 2008. Um, and Videolan is a very weird project for, for video because like it's this weird cone uh, that we want to everyone to have. And um, this code makes absolutely no sense because it's completely unrelated to video, yet it's a, a very strong brand and very strong trademark. Um, so people know the code that plays video. And um, it's a very long story that started by uh, at the Ecole Centrale Paris because in the late 90s, uh, the students who own basically the, the, the campus network wanted to have a new um, a, a new network and no one wanted to pay for it. So they found some broadcasters, um, which is uh, French broadcasters, and they said, well, you know, the future of video is the satellite. So if you can like do a solution where there is only one satellite dish for all the students and you use everything on the network, then we will pay you for a new network. And this is the reasons why we have video LAN is that what they wanted was just have a new network and they try to kill their network, which has a 10 megabit token ring network and kill it and show that video ne needed better um, networking. And so that's how they started. The project could have stopped after two years where they did the demo and it worked fine, but they wanted to, um, to turn that into open source. And, and in 2001, this project became open source and uh, there were multiple parts of VideoLAN, one of them being the client. And the client became VLC. Um, but VideoLAN has numerous uh, projects. Um, VLC is one, which is VideoLAN client. But there are lots of libraries, uh, li libraries for uh, decoding, like DTS or um, Dolby. There is a DVD description, the Blu-ray stack description. Uh, there is also the famous X264 encoder, which is probably one of the most used encoder in the world. Probably most of the video we see online are used, uh, encoded by X264, or lately a decoder called David, which is doing AV1 decoding. And all of those projects and many others are part of the Videolan nonprofit umbrella project. Of course, people now knew the code. Um, the code was like very early um, in the history of VLC, and it, it kept uh, being used like that. Um, when I travel a bit far from France, they don't know, of course, the Ecole Centrale Paris or Evidolan, but they know the cone that plays the videos. Um, we're talking about a software that is quite used. We're talking about around 1 million downloads per day and around 500 million users on all platforms. So those are estimates, of course, because we don't track our users, but that's probably one in the top 10 or top 20 uh, software used on, on computers. And it, it became popular because by default, VLC um, is able to play everything. And at uh, early 2000, where you, when you wanted to download a video that, of course, was legally downloaded, um, there were so many codecs. And like it, you had to install new codec packs. And those codec packs were a nightmare because often they came with adware or spyware. They were basically destroying your computer 
because and it also never worked perfectly. So you installed another codec pack and it was conflicting with the previous one. So everything was quite difficult. And VLC, because it was uh, basically a, a Linux software, um, it, it used the Linux way of packaging, which is one package that has everything. And it used and brought a lot of uh, codecs. Um, and because it was able to do satellite, which was MPEG-2, it was very easy to, to get DVDs. And once you get DVDs, then you get um, a lot of other codecs. And while it was, because it was open source, many people arrived and added new um, support for new formats. And that's how VLC being, became popular because it was able to play everything. Of course, it's not true. It doesn't play everything, but it actually plays a lot of things because we integrate everything inside the same package. We work everywhere, of course, Windows, Linux, Mac, but Android, iOS, um, Xbox, but we still also have versions for OS2 and, of course, all the BSDs and Solaris of the web. Um, and, and I'll explain why, but VLC being very modular, it's able to run everywhere and play everything. So here is like the very old version of VLC. It's still called VideoLAN client because it was really the client of the streaming solution for the Ecole Centrale campus. Um, of course, it's a James Bond DVD because the first DVD that was played in VLC was GoldenEye. So all the basically you know, our um, code names were used um, from GoldenEye and other James Bond movies. Um, very early, we were able to have a live playback of uh, TV, um, and we did some some uh, some partnership with Roland Garros a long, long time ago. That's probably GNOME 2. So um, it's so here is like one of the first version that was able to play live TV, which is quite important because it was a partnership with Roland Garros, and this is about what we've done lately, but in 8K. Um, this is the main version of VLC that people started by using. Um, which was also the first one on macOS. And it was also important in the history of VLC because VLC was the only way to play DVDs on macOS 10 because there was no legal way of doing that. And because VLC had this decryption library for DVD, we were able to, to do this. Um, but it's very important to understand that VideoLAN and most of the open source uh, community is done by people who are working on their free time. Um, which means that everything that is powering open source multimedia in FFmpeg, X264, MPV, VLC, and XIF are basically people working on their free time. And we, a lot of them are uh, gathered around VideoLAN uh, when we meet. So we have a, a basically a nonprofit that is managing everything uh, around VideoLAN, and it's mostly around uh, VLC core developers and FFmpeg core developers. And this nonprofit has a trademark of VLC, is able to do the sharing um, of the website of the, and basically is a legal editor of VLC and other software. Um, it's also important to understand that a software like VLC is very, has like not many people working on it. The, the core team is maybe five to 10 people and um, those people are the ones that are reviewing the code and are act, like applying the code. But every year we have around 100, 150 uh, contributors. And since the beginning of VLC, it's maybe 800 or maybe 1,000 of people who are coming. But most of the decisions are taken by a, a very small team. And the, this has an issue is that we accept the code based on the quality of the code because the core team is going to be the one that is going to maintain the code, right? So we have extremely high quality um, to accept code inside VLC, which is why sometimes there are some weird features inside VLC, but they were very good quality, while there are things that are in other media players and that seems obvious as a feature that are not in VLC because, well, the code quality wasn't there. So. The question arises often is, why is VLC popular, right? It was not the first media players. Um, there are many other media players that worked very well at, at that time, right? At that time, there was 20 different. Why did VLC stay? Um, and, and there are three. There is, of course, some non-technical reasons, um, mostly around the trademark. But the three main reasons is that we kept things quite simple and quite extendable. 
Um, so there is a fact that we use modules, there is a fact that we use C, and that we are uh, network oriented. So the architecture of VLC is very heavily uh, modular, right? There is a small core that is around 80,000 lines of code, which is not that much in C. And it's basically loading modules for features um, because um, every functionality is a module, right? You need a new codec, a new format, it's a module. And this uh, module loading architecture allow people to arrive and contribute to VLC and, and basically um, extend it. So a lot of the features that you've seen are basically have been contributed back by users um, who never understood how the core was. So what you see is that there is a small core, and then there is a simple API called libvlc, which allows people to use application, to build applications on top of it, or like VLC. So what's important to understand is that VLC is actually not a media player. It's a full uh, multimedia framework based on a graph and that loads module at runtime. And one of the use cases is VLC, but it's not the only one. Um, a lot of applications, especially on mobile, are using libvlc engine uh, behind to, to power the video. The second reason um, it got popular was that we used um, a very, what we call the kind of C object, is we use only C. And C is a very simple language, has a lot of issues, but it's simple. And um, there are not many subversion of the language, right? So uh, we use basically a lot of structure, anonymous structures, and a very simple uh, in heritage uh, based on, on C. But because of that, it was um, very fast to compile and also very simple to compile on every platform. Because at the time where we started VLC, C++ sometimes was difficult to compile on some platforms, um, especially when you need to cross compile and so on. Right. So, so being focused on C um, made it simpler to, to port on numerous platforms, but also kept it simple for newcomers to arrive and work on the, pro on the project. And finally, the third reason is because of the story of VLC, which was basically a player for a streaming um, for a streaming protocol, um, the, everything is network oriented, which means that on a network, especially for multicast, you don't expect the files to be complete. You expect networking issues to happen. And because of that, you work around the issues, right? So for example, if you don't have the metadata, well, you say, well, that happens, and you try to play anyway. Um, and so when you started downloading things around whatever, if you play with Windows Media Player or other, other classical media player, they're just going to say, well, I'm sorry, I don't have the metadata, so I cannot play it because the metadata is in the end. While for VLC, it's just going to say, well, you know what? I don't have the metadata. I'm just going to try to play it anyway and see what happens. And that's very interesting because it allows you to read even when the data is corrupted, which also happens when you have very high bandwidth uh, network, and especially for 8K, when you start to have three, 400, 500 megabits per second, it starts to be quite quite important to, to be resilient. But also when you're downloading things and you just want to know if the content is the right, right one. And this became um, quite important, uh, and that's why VLC is used in most of the professional broadcasting world, but also for people who are downloading over the internet. And so those three things made it that um, VLC was more resilient than other media players, it was easier to contribute, and it was easier to add new formats. And because of that, uh, those are, which are very technical reasons, then VLC became more popular. I'm just going to show you a bit of the uh, various uh, VLC versions we had. We had a version on the first version of Android, and of course it became a bit nicer. Uh, we have a version, and the Android version works on Chrome OS and works also on Android TV. Um, we had a version on, on iPad and iPhones. We got pulled out by Apple, I think, two or three times, and then we came back. Um, and now we have a version that is a bit more modern. We have a version that runs on the Apple Watch. Of course, it's not allowed on the store because it basically kills the battery on your watch, but still, it kind of works. Um, and we have a, a version on, on the Apple TV. Um, so, yeah, so you have a 
more or less like an information about what is VLC. And now I'm going to speak about AK and an experiment that we did, which was live encoding of HCVC in 8K and um, transmit it over a 5G network and be able to play it back on 8K with extremely low latency. And of course, all that was done with HDR, um, technically HLG, but HDR. So like as Maxim was um, saying, we are basically at the best that we could do and it's probably the best that we're going to be able to do for a long time. So um, it was on the main court of uh, the Roland Garros um, Open, um, a very expensive camera, which was a, a, a 8K um, HDR camera uh, shooting in 10 bit. Um, quite difficult to calibrate, to be honest, but we managed to do that. And it was basically streaming it um, to with uh, uh, SDI converters um, around 50 gigabit per second, and then send that basically to a video switcher, uh, which was basically doing the um, compositing, adding the, the logo, and all that was done directly from the camera um, to the SDI um, switcher. Um, and from there, it was encoded in two ways. The first way was a kind of neck encoder, which was doing the 8K encoding. Technically, it wasn't 8K, it was 4, 4K um, encoder that were put together and was basically sliced. Um, and um, this you, that you can see in red um, was able to produce one HVC uh, 100 megabits per second 10 bit with uh, HLG. And this was basically sent through Dash on the network. And at the same time, it was being transcoded to lower the resolution and sent um, in, um, in a more classical way. So that was basically the encoding setup. There is, it was a bit more complex for because they wanted to do other things and other demos at the same time. But what happened is that in the end, we had a normal machine uh, with a Intel CPU and NVIDIA graphic card that was basically playing back uh, this uh, Roland Garros feed in 8K um, in HDR. So as the demo went pretty well, we didn't have that much to modify on VLC to be able to do that, but we had like several issues that we had to fix. So I'm just going to now to explain a bit how the video pipeline of VLC uh, worked in the past and how we made it evolve. So in, in the classical sense in VLC, mostly VLC1 and VLC2, the, everything was done on software on the CPU. So what you see in orange on, on, the, on the video is that of course you had the video codec that was a software codec that was giving you basically a software buffer. And then you had like several filters running on the CPU, which then were pushed to the video output, whether it's Direct3D, OpenGL, or similar, um, similar technologies. And this video output was the one that was actually um, converting the buffers and send them to the blue part, which is basically the GPU. And this is how VLC worked for a long time because, well, the video, the software codecs were quite fast and hardware decoders um, are very painful because there are many bugs in mostly on, on the software and the video drivers and the GPU drivers. So VLC was doing that for a long time. And then the computer became lighter and lighter and the video became more and more difficult. So when we arrived at HG um, and HVC arriving in HG, a lot of CPU were way too weak to be able to decode real time. And therefore, you really wanted to leverage the hardware decoder of the, um, of the machine, which gave us this new version, which was Basically, the video decoder was done on the GPU, so we send like the compressed frames, the compressed uh, frames to the video decoder, which is in hardware, and then the hardware basically gave it, gave it back to you in software on the CPU, and then you you keep the rest of the chain. The advantage of doing that was that you didn't have too much to modify to VLC, but there was a big issue with that is that the copying back from um, from um, basically a hardware a GPU back to the software on CPU is extremely costly because most of the PCI Express, AGP or link for video cards are done to push buffers and textures 
to the to the to the video graphic card and not on the other way around. So uh, this way of doing um, was more or less working to solve the issue, but it, it didn't solve um, for um, more complex use case because after you go for 4K, uh, it became more complex um, because the copying back was too slow. And we had at the same time an issue because we, that's around the time where we're starting to have a lot of users on the mobile. And for the same reasons on mobile, you have a very small CPU and GPU. And so we moved from software decoding to hardware decoding. And um, we had to modify the pipeline, the video pipeline for VLC just for mobile. So when we arrive at the time where we, we must have 8K, it's absolutely not possible anymore. You need to be able to do video decoding, video filters, and video output in um, completely on the GPU space. And this is, of course, the most efficient, but it's less um, interesting for people like us because you are limited by the filters that basically are provided by the hardware. You're limited by the bugs and the limitation of the video of the of the video decoder in the hardware and also video output. So around that time, we started modifying the VLC to basically do most of it um, on the GPU, but also being able to do both. So whether depending on the format, you would either get GPU decoding or software decoding. And depending on the filter, you would either have the full GPU or mixed GPU CPU pipeline. And what we're working on, which was also done for the demo, is to be able to have custom uh, OpenGL, Vulkan, or Metal uh, video filters to modify directly the output. So in order to get this 8K performance, we had to do a few modifications. Um, the first in, that happened in VLC 3.0, so now around four years ago, was work around opaque buffers instead of software buffers, right? So that's CV pixel buffer ref on iOS, Direct3D texture 2D on Direct3D, or the same for Direct3D 9. And on OpenGL, of course, it's a lot more difficult. But basically, we had to modify the whole pipeline of VLC to be able to work with opaque buffers and not buffers. But in order to also support still the software decoding, we had to have those kind of buffers being able to either have opaque or traditional textures. At the same time, we merged the mobile and the desktop pipeline because the mobile had some limitations because it was faster, uh, almost full GPU, but it was like less flexible. So we spent our time some to do some pipeline so that the whole pipeline of the graph of VLC was similar on the mobile and on the desktop. And then, especially for the 8K video output, we had a, a, a weird issue is that um, the camera, of course, because it's a broadcast camera, was shooting uh, HDR as HLG, but the Windows, uh, especially Windows 10, only supported HDR10, right? So one is based on PQ10, and the other is based on HLG, which makes it different. Um, and the result was not good. So we basically wrote, almost when we arrived um, on the tennis court, some custom shaders to transfer live, uh, convert live HLG to HDR10. Those were HLS, um, HLSL uh, shaders. And um, this was more or less working. Uh, but we, when we put everything to, to production, um, everything was extremely slow. And the reason is, in VLC, we try to use as many decoders, threads, as we can, right? So when you're going to decode H.264, you're going to use four threads. But for HVC, maybe we're going to use 16 threads. And when we arrived to the point where we had to do that for 8K, we arrived at 32 threads. And that became too difficult and too slow because the synchronization was extremely slow, um, especially for the hardware um, case. So in when we did software decoding, having 16 or 32 threads worked. Well, we had some memory issue that we fixed during the Roland Garros um, project. But also, when we did um, hardware decoding, having only two threads is way better. Because basically, what happens on the hardware is that it's a kind of asynchronous API. And so you basically push buffers, and then you get a callback. And you just do that in two threads, and that's enough. 
Um, if we did more, we basically starved the threads and the hardware got completely lost. Um, we saw that in the Intel decoder and on the NVIDIA decoder. So we modified all that um, on the video output and it worked quite well. But as I said, we need to do more. So for 4.0 and um, the version um, that was on Roland Garros was a kind of 4.0 version, is that we are now using a push model. Um, in the past, in VLC, we had a video pool model. So you ask basically the graphic card, your, the, the, the native texture they support, and then you take a buffer, then you get it back to the decoders and then take it push back on, on the video filters. So this is important when your hardware, your video hardware is limited. But when you have a video hardware that is basically able to do shaders, it's less useful. But also because that means that when you configure your video output in a pool model, it's fixed. You cannot change it again, right? Because you take the textures and the buffers from the graphic card and you put them directly um, on, on the whole pipeline. So if you have a, a filter that is changing your pipeline and which something happens often with HDR when you need to move from 8-bit to 10-bit or change the HDR output, um, you keep basically having mismatch between your video output and your um, video decoder. And so you insert inverse uh, filters, which are quite slow. So the idea is, and we are finishing that right now on VLC, is to have everything, especially on video, as a push model. And in the end, basically, the video output is going to adapt. And that's true because today, most of the video output technologies are able to do shaders. But it wasn't in the past. Uh, and doing that allows us to have um, a more flexible pipeline where we can have software filters, hardware filters, OpenGL filters. So the three type of filter all linked together with without in the end needed to um, reinsert uh, the original uh, configuration. And as I said, now we have like GPU filters that allow us to basically run any type of filters uh, that we used to do in CPU on the GPU, whether the hardware supports it or not. And finally, uh, we are related to that, and we're going to, it's important, we have a new API for libvlc, so when you use the engine, that is going to basically push some texture directly, and it's going to be useful not for Roland Garros and 8K, but other 8K usage. I'm going to talk about that just after. The other modification we had to do is weirdly on, on the, not on the video output, but on the input buffering model. The, VLC buffering model, because it's network-based, is takes extremely small amount of um, cache from the network and is buffering all the time, which is the opposite of what Netflix or Facebook or, or YouTube are doing, where they buffer the maximum amount of video and then play back from it. In VLC, we are extremely network conscious and resource conscious, and we take only what we want. The problem is that when you start to have extremely large buffers, uh, for 100 megabit per second, like this 8K feed, it's difficult to manage because the buffer is often um, basically draining. And also, because you buffer in term, in number of seconds, sometimes the, the encoder is varying a lot depending on what is happening. And so you can have like two or eight megabits per second, and like two seconds after, it's 100 megabits per second. And so the VLC buffer was not really done for those kind of models. So we had to modify and this. So, of course, when we did the demo, it, well, we didn't have that much time, as I said. So we basically patched it by having a larger buffer um, and introducing a module, which was the prefetch module. But um, the more we prefetched, the, the, um, the less it was going to be live. So we had to modify um, and do a small uh, prediction model for that so that we could improve the buffering uh, scenario of VLC. And it was working well. Um, for 5.0, so I don't know when, we're going to rework all that. Um, weirdly, the most difficult part of that project was not on VLC. The most difficult part was to be able to configure a Windows 10 machine with an 8K screen without HDMI 2.1. It was full link of HDMI 2.0. And this was a nightmare because in order to configure that, you had like we had like one big NVIDIA card with four outputs. And 
the mapping and the configuration of the Windows display, uh, which were four displays, as HDR, because we wanted, of course, to have the full HDR in 10-bit 422, um, was quite complex and was crashing the driver. So we had to uh, basically force VLC to be like the exclusive owner of the video card um, to be able to have something that was stable. And finally, the last modification we had to do was to modify a bit the, the UI of VLC, so it was outcoding the video display, and some modification of the adaptive streaming because the Dash version that was at that demo was, as always with Dash, kind of custom, so we had to modify that. But with all those modifications, which all took around two or three days, we were able to, uh, we arrived like two days before the event and like two days after it was working well. Um, uh, one of the biggest issues we had was around 5G. Um, because it was one of the earliest experiments of 5G, and it um, kind of worked, but kind of not worked. So the other main use case, uh, except the, the sport games, as I said, is VR. So five or six years ago, everyone was fond of VR, um, and then it died. And well, now with AR and Metaverse and whatever Facebook is doing, it's coming back. But when you do VR, and especially a playback of, of um, 360 videos, um, whether they're stereo or mono, um, you really need to have an extremely large. Um, um, so the, as I say, the when you're watching 360 is your mono or stereo video, you need a very, very uh, large um, resolution because you're going to watch with a, uh, an angle of view which is probably 80, 90, or 100 degrees, but you're going to move your head around, so you need to, have deco to decode everything real time. So if you want to have a decent resolution, you need to be able to decode 8K videos. Or even more to be to have a definition that is more or less correct, um, and um, so we modified VLC to be able to play that uh, directly, um, either uh, for HMDs with the correct uh, matrix projection or just normal 360 video movies on, on your screen. Um, but because of that, there are many use cases that are appearing around 8K, which are related to VR and AR. And what we developed lately is a Unity and Unreal plugin so that applications which are targeted VR, AR, or everything related to that can basically get directly a playback of VLC, and whether it's Dash or HLS or any other type of live scenario, RTMP, RTSP, and display that directly inside their video application in VR or in other 3D use cases. And for that, like being able to decode 8K with almost no copies and in the maximum performance is very important because there is a lot of things that are happening on the CPU, but also a lot of things that are going to happen on the 3D um, screen and of, uh, on the scene that is in your 3D uh, environment. So you really need to be as fast and uh, as resource um, careful as possible. And because of that, we basically did this new libvlc texture API where we basically decode the textures, and instead of displaying it ourselves, we give it, you give, we give you a reference so that you can basically take the texture without any copy of the texture. So thank you. Uh, this is the end of my presentation, and I think we have time for questions. So let's uh, uh, first, Jean Baptiste. Thank you for this uh, for this uh, presentation. It's really interesting because uh, uh, it's uh, there are a lot of issues, and we are working on the on the limits of the hardware, and everything everything is uh, very very important here. So we have uh, some questions. The first is uh, uh, from our chat. Are there, um, uh, what about the portability of your models or the building blocks uh, that you that you uh, build right now in VLC? How do you maintain the portability of them between different platforms? So, uh, are there any new issues with moving to 8K? Yes. So that, that's all, that's a very good question, and that's one of the issues with hardware decoders is when you have software decoders, this basically it's C and assembly, right? So it works and runs exactly the same on all the platforms. Um, when you move to hardware decoders, um, 
it's extremely linked to the quality of your hardware and your drivers. So, of course, when you move from Windows to Mac to Linux, it's different. But even on the same uh, platform, it's difficult. Um, so what we are doing right now is, for example, to have like one set of filters and compile it on all the platforms with transpiling the shaders. And the second thing is that we have a kind of test suite of VLC, which is stressing the hardware. And we are testing a lot of the hardware and check whether we we like it or not. And we if we don't, we basically block this platform or another one. So, and um, finally, the last thing that we're doing is we try to have more modules that are common and less that are uncommon uh, per platform. But this is a concern. And so far, there is no good answer because like, Intel GPU drivers are very um, variable in quality depending on the version and depending on the hardware. Okay, got it. Um, I also have uh, one question from me because um, uh, uh, it was not very clear for me uh, about the push model. Is it something like sending messages? Uh, so, yeah, so, so. When you have VLC, you have basically, so it's a graph, right? So at runtime, you build a graph. And so you start with your uh, input, which is HTTP or file. Then you get to Dmaxer, which is basically MKV, AVI, Dash, and so on. Then it splits in different stream, audio, video, and then decoders, and then it push, right? So traditionally, the whole part of video around video is a, a, a pool model because your hardware was limited and had one type of buffer that it understood in our overlay. And because you had this overlay model, um, basically your, your, your graphic cards supported NV12, and it was able to stretch the overlay in NV12, but in no other formats. Mm -hmm. So in that case, you, you really cared about doing that. So you ask the video output what was the... Uh, uh, format they natively support, and then from the beginning of the video decoding pipeline, you use its format. But if you had a filter that was only in hardware or only working on 12-bit, it forced you to move from 8-bit to 12-bit, do the filter in 12-bit, go back to 8-bit, and then go to the video output. And this is extremely inefficient if you can say that your video output is going to be able to adapt. Um, today, I say 95% of the cases of VLC, you have a VR output that is able to run custom code in shaders on the GPU. So you're really going to try to minimize the number of conversions and push that from one module, whether decoders, video filters, um, resamplers, and the video output in, um, in push, right? So you do one, it pushes, and it's the next step that is adapting, and the next step is adapting, instead of having everyone to adapt on the on the last uh, step. Uh, OK. Uh, it's really interesting. So uh, again, thank you for this presentation. Uh, I think that, uh, this, uh, that we are going to stop our uh, broadcasting right now. And let's continue to, let's move to the Zoom uh, and have uh, another discussion. So and again, uh, thank you for this presentation. It's really interesting. And we'll thank see you for having me. And you, know where you to, and you know how to contact me. I'm easy to find. OK. Uh, let's meet in Zoom.